Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. It is now 8.02. Sorry for the two minute start. Brom is, uh, couldn't make it tonight, so Charlie has asked me to uh, chair this illustrious event tonight. And uh, tonight our speaker is going to be Stephen Walsh, Society, Money, and You, a Historical Approach. To be, before we get into it, I just want to remind the college of two basic rules. One is one fool at a time, and the second one is no personal attacks. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. We are going to videotape for eventual distribution to the web. Uh, there's a lot up there now, but uh, unfortunately I haven't uploaded quite a bit yet, but there's a lot in the pipeline ready to go. We break this down into three different segments. One is our announcements, followed by our speaker followed by a question and answer period, okay. followed by a, uh, the infamous rebuttal periods. The topic is Society, Money, and You, a historical approach by Stephen Walsh for a presentation here. The power of people's credit should be used to ensure that whatever is socially and physically possible is also financially possible. Austin Mitchell, member of the Parliament of the UK. Well, he's going to be covering the concepts of seniorage with a little bit of historical um, explanation of fiat money, mentioning Sparta, Athens, and the Pennsylvania colony, and particularly with coverage on the National Employment Agency Emergency Defense Need, a public issue of fiat money with a push towards full use of seniorage and potential full employment. All right, let's Let us welcome, Yay. with a bouncing round of applause, Dr. Stephen Welsh. Good evening. Uh, my background is in anthropology and education, and I spent a few, well, I spent the last seven years studying money. Um, oh, uh, salad, you don't have parmesan pepper. The, the first thing, uh, I, everybody should have a sheet, I think. It has, it has my name, and if you don't have a sheet, there's only actually one more copy or two more copies left. Here's an extra one, too. Oh, we're okay. There's someone, oh, who's behind you? Okay. Um, first, my, my background is as an educator. One of the reasons I've become concerned about money is because in, well, I've taught, say, sixth grade social, social studies, uh, seventh and eighth grade, too. And I've taught, they now have a nice cool game called the stock market game. And you get your students into teams, groups of three and four, and they're given $100,000, and they're told to go and pick stocks and, and figure things out and make money. And, and then when they get a little, little bit better, they, they teach the kids how to work on margin. And uh, so if you have a start out with 100000 we can it's boosted up to 200000 well, and what I noticed among the students is they became very interested in just making money, making money, making money. And that's not what was missing in that was real getting the students to think about in terms of their metacognition, how do they think about their thinking and their learning. And I was very concerned that I was just training these kids to be greedy. And in, when kids are four years old, five years old, out in the playground, they have a strong sense of fairness. And, and in sixth grade, am I teaching them out of their sense of fairness? And that, that worried me. I asked them, I asked them, and they turned around, turned things around a bit, and I asked them, if you had all of the money, what would you do with it? Oh, I'd give it to my friends, my friends would have this and that. And uh, what happens someone's sick? Oh, we would take care of them. What I found in their writing was that they, would, they still had it inside of them to be concerned about their fellow humans and to be concerned about others. And so what I saw as four and five years old, I was seeing later on. And 
and I didn't want that to be lost on one. And then I got two more ideas as an educator that, and it's concerned me about today. One is, instead of being so concerned, I see students being so concerned and young, young adults so concerned about money and making money, where are, where are your natural gifts, I'm thinking for them? What, what is your God-given or your nature-given gifts? And, and, and how you know if you have that gift or not, if you're developing it is, one way you know if you have a special gift is if you give it away and you don't need anything in return. Then you'll know if it's a gift. And there's a fellow named Parker Palmer. He took it even one step further, in a Quaker saying, You'll, you'll, know, you'll know if that gift is in touch with the earth. If you're in touch with your deepest needs and your deepest gifts, you'll also be in touch with the earth's deepest needs. And we can, we, so from there I've been trying to think about a sense of harmony with humans in the future for, uh, on the planet earth here. I was in, involved in an environmental committee, a, a national steering committee among Quakers. Um, I'm not a real practicing Quaker, but I found them very interesting. And they said there's a real deep concern between money and the environment, and humanity going off of a cliff environmentally, and uh, what are we going to do? We need to learn about money. And that was about seven, eight years ago, and I've been representing or, or, or I've been doing that since then and I found money to be a, a really interesting topic. I want to, before going into this though, I want to mention one idea about um, the NEED Act. As you may know, about a month ago, Dennis Kucinich introduced Public Law 6550. No. 2990, sorry. Uh, it was 6550 last December when it was first introduced in the new congressional season and uh, session and it had to be reintroduced and it's 2990 this time. And, and what I've noticed in the, is one of the key ideas in it is in fractional reserve banking, you have, say you start with $10 million and the bank can loan out, therefore, $9 million, say at a 10% reserve. They loan out $9 million. Those people earn it and deposit it, and that turns into $19 million total circulation. And then of that $9 million that was just redeposited, it can be redeposited, it can be loaned out again, and it gets redeposited at $8,100, you're up to $27. And, and you keep that up, you can go up to 100 from 10 million, you can have in total circulation eventually $100 million. The NEED Act stops that, and it stops that in this way. It's that you're, you, the bank has $10 million in deposits right away, and that's the only money there is. So what happens is, the people who deposit that money have to be very concerned. It's going to work like an old-fashioned building society in the future. The, uh, the bill, the NEED Act, has a positive money act in uh, the U of K in, in um, London. And they're a little, they push this part a little further, but our, our bill implies this. So what it is is, if you're a depositor and you have part of that original $10 million in the bank, you have to be concerned about that $10 million and you may be concerned about where that money is being invested. If you have scruples not to have it invested in the military and to armaments, for example, you, you may, you may want to know where that investment is going. And you're taking risks. And the bank may tell you, but if you want an 8% return, you're going to take a higher amount of risk than if you want a 6 or a 4 or a 3% return. So people would have to um, be concerned as depositors where, where their money is going. And what it does then is that that money lend, is lent out, you're lending out that, those people's money. 
and it's not newly created money as it is happening right now. So, so the distinction we can make, and we'll, we'll come back to this later in the question period though, is that you, you can stop fractional reserve banking this multiplying by saying it's that 10 million and that money is being re-loaned out. And that's a very important concept because it frees up your senior rich and I'm going to spend a large part of the night going over two, two concepts, seniorage and fiat money. It frees up your seniorage to do very important things. That other piece of that expansion in the fractional reserve banking, well, that's where the government can stop in, much like in FDR's times, and create money. Or, like during the Civil War when we had greenbacks, when the Populist Party in the late 1800s was wanting a reissue of greenbacks. And the banks didn't want that because it wasn't in their best interest. And finally, they won the game when, in 1913 with the Federal Reserve Act. And they got to have fractional reserve banking. In a small way, only 37.5% had to be held back then. But it was the beginning. And if you give the banks the, 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 tr the trend, um, for all banks, in many countries, from the Bank of England across Europe and here, is if you're making money, you want to be able to make more money. And so they were able to cut back from 37.5% over the last century to 10% of the fractional reserve. And so the concern is, yes, it's good to have community banks, it's good to have state banks, but let's, let's envision banks of how they need to be in the future. And if we're lending out money, indeed, maybe the depositors need to be a part of that and being concerned where that money is being lent out to. So coming back to education then for a moment, when I work with my students, I want them to think about these issues. I want them to think about what type of system they want. And I want to share with you a few tools to help think about it. And just one example is, if you were going to create an economic system, and you're a young person, and you all are pretty young to me, um, is you want to have a target of 2% inflation, or maybe 0% inflation. Right now, the Fed, and Uncle Ben Bernanke, has a 2% inflation target, and we've had that for a long time. But if we're considering um, limiting our growth or to being in harmony with the earth, maybe it would be nice for us to play around with 0% inflation. Maybe that would take uh, less pressure off of the older people in society that's living on so much of return that they can hold their money and it's th they know it's there and they're not losing value and they don't have to worry about it in the same way. But um, I look forward to more questions about the, uh, the NEED Act later on. Um, okay, now, now some basic ideas. I'm just going to read, and I won't read very much, <laughs> but I just wanted to go over um, a few quotes here because I think they're important conceptually for us to think about. And, and in this in the sense, creating an economic system or creating a monetary system for the future and for uh, and for your consideration. Uh, the first quote is, the power of the people's credit should be used to ensure that whatever is socially and physically possible is also financially possible. This, um, a member of parliament from UK, Austin Mitchell, wrote that. It, it came out of this book, Fantopian Perspective, but it, it's been written Fantopia. And the, and the author, James Gibbs Stewart, um, he was an industrialist, but he got into money. And in, in 1982, he wrote The Money Bomb. And uh, he, be, he looked at banking, and he became very concerned about it. And in here, uh, the, the title is, or the subtitle is, For a Balanced Economy, 
invoking the public credit and social justice. And in, in this book, he talks about Temple D and Temple Dung. And Temple D is on one side of the Queen's Kingdom, and Temple Dung is on the other side. Temple D, they both want to build bridges to the next territory over the, over the rivers that they're next to. Temple Dung gets the banks that, and, the, and the financial consultants to do it, and they do it as you might think we would do it today. They get, you know, raise money, put up toll booths, and the whole, the whole nine yards. Tito D sets up, prints money and sets up a social credit system where they pay for the bridge. They look at their physical and financial, uh, physical and social. Do they have the talents that they needed? Do they have the materials? And if they had that, then they, they can invoke social credit and then they created the money that they would need to build that bridge. And they spent that money into circulation. And, and the people worked for that money knowing they were, go, they were working to their potential in building that bridge. And they had excess capacity, and they used that capacity to build that bridge, and they created the money to, to use that excess capacity. And I, I'll come back to that in just a moment. Now from a high school. I'm going to read something very similar from a high school textbook. It's uh, Economics, Principles in Action. And this is what your, uh, our students get in uh, their third or fourth year of uh, high school. And the quote is, uh, and from two university professors, Stephen Schifrin and Arthur O'Sullivan, who got their PhDs at Princeton and MIT and wrote in a high school economics textbook. The government could create new money to pay salaries for its workers and benefits for citizens. Traditionally, governments simply pr printed the bills they needed. Today, the government can create money electronically by depositing money in people's banking accounts. The effect is the same. This approach works for relatively small deficits and can cause severe problems when they are large deficits. Why? And, and this is all a quote. When the government creates more money, it increases the amount of money in circulation. This increases the demand for goods and services and can increase output. But once the economy has reached full employment, output cannot increase. That's the key idea, idea there. But once the economy has reached full employment, employment output cannot increase. The increase of money will mean there are more do uh, dollars for the same amount of goods and services. The result is in inflation. What they're saying in this high school textbook, see if we were going to govern, if we were going to gamble and let government create the money that might be a good thing, but we would have to be very concerned about inflation. And if they're taking our unemployed, underemployed, or misemployed people today and giving them significant work to do, nurses, teachers, bridge builders, levee builders, new levees for New Orleans, etc., etc., that's not inflationary, these authors are saying. It only becomes inflationary is when you create money beyond full employment, beyond putting people to work. So if you have the resources and you have the, the expertise, you have the people available, you can train them, pay them for training if you need to, but you can pay them to work and create the society you want. It only becomes inflationary when you, increase, uh, when you print money beyond people's full employment. And, and um, we can bring this up in questions with other countries or whatever you want, but I, I'll, I'll stop at that point. Uh, lastly, the last little quote is very simple. As I heard it explained from Professor Yamaguchi from uh, Doshiki, Dohishi 
Kisha University in Japan. He also is uh, at the University of California, Berkeley. It is not inflationary to create money for jobs to fill the GDP gap. And there, the idea is, and I, we all have maybe funny notions of what GDP is, but the traditional notion, let's look at it, there's problems with it because it, it'll account, it doesn't account for any morality and how things are. But if our potential gross domestic product is up here, but because people are not working, underemployed, unemployed, that the level of GDP because of that is much lower today. So what Yamaguchi is saying is, this gap, you can print the money, you can you can print, you can even for, you can counterfeit the money if you can make the counterfeit stick. But you can create the money, let people work, and fill in the GDP gap so you can have full employment. The question then is, how would we do this monetarily? How would we do this in Fantopia? Or how would we do this in the United States? That's what we need to think about right now. If they're telling us, from MIT and Princeton that it's possible, from, you know, this Yamaguchi who's, you know, their Harvard University professor saying that we can do this. This wonderful uh, industrial person retired in, in his 80s, he made his money and he wrote, he was concerned, and he's saying we can do this. Why are we having the problems today? Why are we having these crises and why aren't people being, why isn't the money being created? We did it in the past. We created. Yeah, I gas. got it, Sam. We put everyone to work for the Civil War. You want us to answer that? Yeah, you're answer. <laughs> I'm going to let you stew on that for a bit. Okay. okay. Do you I know, know where we can answer. A rhetorical pause, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> it was a rhetorical yeah. pause, Laura. <laughs> I know you're. I know your lips are greased, dear. Just ask it. Okay. Everybody will get their turn. Okay, to understand, though, how we need to move ourselves so that we can have this very healthy society we dream about, I'm going to bring up this concept of seniorage, and I'm going to give it play in a few different contexts because it's very important to understand, and it's not something simple. It gets played out in different societies, so we're going to get a flavoring of that. And there's another word, a corresponding word that goes with it, and it's, in, it's, on your, it's on your note sheet, if I can say that. From the American Heritage Dictionary, seniorage, seniorage, you can pronounce it either way, and it's under there. Profit made by a government by issuing currency, especially the difference between the face value of coins and their production costs. And historical, the crown's right to a percentage on bullion brought to a mint for coining. I'm going to read that one more time, and then I'm going to break it out and, and give you some examples of it. And then... And, um, First, profit made by a government by issuing currency. And as an example, the difference between the face value of coins and their production costs. So let's go over that. That is, what does it cost to make our coins today? What does it cost to make our bills and notes? Now, the cost to make it is one thing. But it's worth a whole lot more. You put a 1 or 5 or a 10 or a 20 on that piece of paper, it, it gets quite valuable very quickly. So the question is, who gets to spend it first? And how can you stretch that money to create a healthy society? So we'll go into that. But now you've created this money. Who gets to spend it first? 
the next thing, the next part in here, it talks about coins and their production. So I'm going to go over an example, and it says that the crown's right, and I'm going to give an example uh, of Spain in the 1700s. It, it applied to the whole 17th century in Spain. To a percentage on bullion brought to a mint for coining. During the entire century of the 1600s, the king and queen of Spain, whichever it was at, at any given year, they would get the conquistadors, and they would get their, they would give a charter to those who they would semi-trust, and they would have a more trusted person go along with them, and they would be in charge of going to Peru, um, Portugal and to Brazil, but they would go to Peru, to Mexico, with the silver mines, Bolivia, and they would take the native peoples or bring in slaves or, or maybe even have some soldiers do it at times, but they would be pulling the bullion, the silver out of these mines, the gold out of these mines, and collecting it, and then they would have to guard it. And then they had permission to make coins out of it. So they had a mint operation going right in South America or Mexico. And the deal was, oh, and they had to get transportation costs. And the deal was 20% of whatever they were pulling out, or, by the way, whatever they could steal, too, from the, whoever they got it from, 20% of everything had to go back to the crown. And that was the crown's cut, if you will. And the rest was, from the crown's perspective, the cost of, of making that money, of making that coin, of making that, what we might call a commodity money, because uh, it, it, it had oftentimes the value of the coin, well, the coinage itself. The crown, during the whole 1600s, made that 20%. They called it un quinto. Sometimes they made a little more on taxes too, but they made that 20, that un quinto, that 20%, and that was their cup. And they could use it for the good of, of the crown. They could put in more ornate instruments, that build roads, pay for more army, etc. So that was the idea of seniorage historically. But you can see there in seniorage, the cost to the crown was great. 80% of the potential money that was coming into circulation, they only were able to use for government the first 20%. The 80% got absorbed into the cost of producing it. Well, let's look over time. Those huge costs, it doesn't cost us 80% to produce our money today. It costs very, very little. So we're now we're back at the question again who gets to spend it first. But you're beginning to get the idea of seniorage when we, when we start thinking about this. So what, what we're going to do now is I'm going to bring up another concept and we're going to go visit Sparta, Athens, and then Pennsylvania, uh, the colony of Pennsylvania, to get a deeper understanding of these concepts. Page two, the other side. <laughs> We're going to make reference to one more concept. So tonight we're going to really deal with two concepts. One is seniorage, and I just want us to also understand fiat. What does it mean to be a fiat? And we can, we know fiat, and they then take the word fiat by having authority there, and they make to do something, but then they say fiat money. What does fiat money mean? Well, let's go. The, the, the earlier definition came from American Heritage, and we'll go back to that same dictionary. In convertible paper money made legal tender by a government decree. So it's by government force, if you will, and it's been and it's money that's been made legal tender, and it's inconvertible. What does inconvertible mean there? It means that. If it's a paper money, it cannot be exchanged for gold or some other precious metal. It's inconvertible. We have inconvertible bills and notes today, as you all know, 
They were convertible back in the 20s, but not today. So fiat is, is the government saying this is money. And the general rule is, if you can pay your taxes with it, it's good. You can use it as a medium of exchange in your society or in your local community or your state bank of Illinois or your national government. It becomes a medium of exchange. And that's called, you can use it for currency, like the Ithaca dollars. As long as they can get in New York some government authority to take 5-10% of it, those Ithaca dollars, that becomes a good uh, local currency. Okay. So we got, that's the idea of fiat. And one of the cons concerns we want to have then is a public issue of fiat money versus a private issue of fiat money. Is it the bank that gets to spend the money first or issue the money? Or, it, it, or is it the, the government or the public administration of money that gets to use it for doing good for the public. So one of the it's a public issue of fiat money versus a private issue of fiat money. And we're going to cover that first historically and we can look at that today. Um, and let's and let's get started with that. Well first we're going to go to Sparta. <laughs> and that's Sparta, Athens, and this is back from about 1000 BC to about 300, well, three, yeah, about 350 BC, depending on which year we want to talk about. And I'm calling it a, a tool fiat money. Um, in the Bronze Age, back in Egypt and uh, Babylonian times, they would weigh out gold and silver. And um, and, and, you, you would, and this weighted money became a medium of exchange. It was good, it was small, it was portable, and you could trade goods with it. And it, became, it became important for, for trading. It then, it got up to about 15, 16, 1700 uh, BC, and you had the Phoenicians, and they would put, they, they went a little further with the idea, and they would put the gold and silver in a, a leather pouch, close it off, seal it, and they put the seal of their town on it. And, and when you saw the seal of that town on that size pouch, you knew how much it was. You didn't have to re-weigh out the money anymore. You could then use this as a, a wonderful transaction. By the way, there's a wonderful German author where I'm getting all of this from. There's a guy named Fritz Heichelheim. This guy only wrote three books starting in 1938 to 1968. And he just, and he worked in, he's just amazing. He worked in hieroglyphics, cuneiform, ancient Greek, Latin. And the, this is the book. This is the bibliography in the notes. That's the book. Here's the bibliography in the notes. And, and by the way, later on, afterwards, when I finish, if people want to look at these books and just gather, gather, I brought them in today so people can look at these. And um, if somebody's interested in getting them, you, we could talk about it. But they're. There are books that have been close to me or that have been special for me for some purpose and I brought them and I just wanted to share, share them with you. So we're back up to Phoenician times. Now we've got money that's been stamped or coined, not in part of a bullion. We have um, precious metal in a pouch stamped on and we know its value. <coughs> Well, what happened with the Iron Age that comes out in about another 100 or 200 years is you have tribes that are coming in from the north, and they're bringing in their ideas of exchange, and they're bringing in not weighted precious metal to help trade. They're bringing in goods of a, such, of a nature, of like what's called tool money. And the, one of the earliest tool monies we have in Europe is a hand axe. It's, 
It's a small hand axe, and it's not any good for a hand axe. It's like a child's hand axe, and it was only good for trading purposes. It was something precious, and you could trade with it. At the same time, these things are taking place, by the way, in Europe. They're also taking place simultaneously in China. And, and it's, I, I don't know how or why, if it's a parallel cultural evolution, or, or there's some real cultural contact, I don't know, but it's, it's, it's interesting. It makes, us, it makes me curious how that's happening. In China, they're using knives. First, there was long knives as tool money. The knives get smaller. They're no good for knives. There's a hole in part of it, and it gets smaller and smaller, and then you get down to just holes and coins there. So what we have happening in Europe, they go on to you know, bracelets, portable, uh, could be tool money, uh, could be anything, could be a tool money, and you'd use it for, for trade if it's small and portable. So what happened in, in Sparta is that they have their tool money, and, but they're also learning from these old timers around Egypt, which they're trading with too, that gold and silver and precious metals are an important way, and especially gold and silver. And iron is like the newest precious metal on the scene, but it's strange because it's very plentiful. Well, in parallel lives, and if you look at the story of Lycurgus, he does something, uh, the people in Sparta do something very interesting, and this is tied to this one leader at a time. I, I won't go into a, a lot about his history, but it's a guy named Lycurgus, and he's, it's back in time that he's half mytholo mythological. But we do have his name on the first Olympics as saying there should be a time of peace so we can have this Olympics. So we feel that he is a real person. But what he or but what really indeed happens in Sparta, it's either him inspired or others inspired. They take control of, of Sparta. This is the Dorian tribe, and they settle in islands and they settle in Sparta, which is the Peloponnesian Peninsula in southwest. Uh, Greece, and it's a very fertile area. It's very productive. And in Sparta, they set up Pelinors, becomes their money. And it's like a tool money. All it is is a piece of iron. It's an iron nugget. And that's their money. And they're going to use this iron nugget to trade. And it becomes cumbersome. And they decide that gold or silver will not be a money. And so they have, by public issue, by their government, a fiat money. It's a decree by government, and it's going to be this tool money. And, because, and even though they were aware, what happens at that time, everybody who is interested in making bucks or special high-end artists or, or traders from Athens and other people, they started out avoiding Sparta because they didn't want that tool money, and that was the only thing they were paying with. So they, they want to go to Sparta, and Sparta says, that's fine. We, we've got our own thing going on, and uh, if we need to make trades, we'll find some other way to trade. So they have what you might be calling, or we, we might be calling their own local currency, and that's, and that's okay. So these, and what's interesting, there's very, very something very interesting about these little iron nuggets. They, the iron, when they're producing it, they take that hot iron nugget that's going to be money, and they dip it into vinegar. Why did they dip it into vinegar? Because it's lessened its commodity value. It lost its iron ore value to some degree because of that. So if you wanted iron ore to melt down and to produce a sword, you wouldn't use this iron ore. It wasn't, it, it, it's been spoiled. What like Kyrgyz and, and the others figured out, if you want a money, you don't want to, you don't want a money that's going to be taken away. You want a money that's going to stay local. So they didn't get any, they didn't want a precious metal because that could be taken away. They wanted something that would be good for themselves locally. And so this was these Pelinors.
And the Pelinors, this money drives out everything bad. The, uh, pro prostitution stops. Um, people then spend more time. Local uh, art and housing, uh, beds, chairs become very well made. So that increases. The other thing that increases too is they use this money to create a culture where everyone's together. There's a super sense of togetherness. And the Spartans, because of this, become great warriors, as you know. It's also because, uh, and this is the sad thing about Sparta from, from any modern point of view, is when they took over that land, they took over native peoples there, and they made those native peoples serfs, and those serfs had to were in charge of the agriculture, and they and they would be the warriors in charge of protection, but as like overseers of the serfs too. Um, so, but the, uh, another attribute to them is they ate together. They had messes, and you would give to your local mess, your eating area, and the whole village would be often eating. There was four or five main villages in Sparta, and they would be eating together. And they had two kings, and even even if the king missed dinner, he was fined because everybody it was a togetherness. And it makes for a really interesting culture to study. Okay, that's, that's Sparta. In, in, in contrast to Sparta is Athens. Athens, the story picks up about 600 B.C., 594, 593 B.C., with Solon the Wise. And he does about just the opposite of like Pergus in the Sparta example, and it's, and it's sort of an important example for that reason. I, I might, and I'm putting down here Athens, it's a public issue of fiat money that has commodity value. Um, remember the Spartan example doesn't have commodity value. What Solon does, and it's about his time, it might be slightly after before, but it's attributed often to him. He takes the Angiatic standard, which silver weighs more, it's a heavier piece of silver that was the coin, and he reduced its weight by three sevenths, and he set up a new silver standard for, for weighing it out, and that, and that was, um, what was called the Attic, A-T-T-I-C, that's the surrounding area of Athens, the Attic Standard. And that standard became prevalent all over Greece, all the way uh, into the Alexander the Great, when Alexander the Great uh, sets up his own system. But until that time, for about 400 years, the Attic Standard is predominant. And what takes place then is, it's a smaller so he could take the old coins, send it back to the minting boys or the bullion or whatever, you know, and have it reforged and reminted to have a lesser weight so he could produce more coins and they would have the value out in society as the same purchasing power. You can think of that as inflation. If your population is growing, it's a way of taking a limited amount of money and stretching it further and declaring it a new standard. It, it, and it gave government, it was one way to give government more spending. The thing that Solomon the Wise, he, if you were, if you were a father and you were lost in battle, you're, you're, the wife would have to be taken care of, and he said they would. You weren't going to lose your land, which was typical before, and the state will help raise and pay for your child to be raised to learn industry, to do something. Back then, if you worked with your hands, it was, it was not well thought of, except for agriculture. But so along the wise, he turned that around. He, he promoted the, uh, the craftsmen and skills of all types, and, and the Greeks got into it. And 
and they were quite successful with that in, in for hundreds of years to come. And they and that's why one of the great reasons why Greek culture expanded the way it did. So what we have here is using an internationally accepted money and but giving it having fiat authority, it only costs so much money again, going thinking of the crown, it only costs so much money to mint those coins. And he could stretch it by reducing the weight. But he said it had this much purchasing power. And, and back at that time, we, we, they do have the concept of a drachma, which Greeks might go back to, and we'll see how that happens over the next weeks and months. But at that point, they had also a two drachma coin, and and this and this allowed you know a lot of commerce to take place. Okay, so let's the thing that Solon does too, in different than Sparta, rather than being dominant over the serfs and everything, he sets up a more democratic society, and what he says. I'm not going to take, in, in Sparta, they just took all the land from everybody, and every male in Sparta owned, if there were 15,000 males, they took all the land to put it in 15,000 lots, equal lots of by pr production, and everybody started out with that. That system breaks down over the years, but they, what we read about is them, everybody having a fair share of the wealth, of the natural resources. And that's in the Sparta example. Solon was pushed to do the same thing and become what they would call tyrannos or a, a tyrant at the time. But he didn't do that. He said, let the wealth keep their wealth. But he, he set up his laws where the common person could go on juries. And he created laws that were nebulous that could be interpreted in different ways, and a lot of times things would then therefore have to go to jury. And the jury, made up of commoners, could decide to, to level society, and they would do this. Solon also created laws that if you had land, you could only have so much land. So if you got to so much land, you were limited at that point. If you wanted to pass your land on as an inheritance, that was limited too. And you had to provide for all of your family, not just the few. So what happened with Spartan's rules after about a hundred years, everybody have, it was small d democracy, and there were many, many small land holdings, and there weren't large land holdings. And so you can democratize. You, you have the Sparta tradition, which is more of a communist, socialist tradition, where you can set in some rules into play in Athens, where you can have this happen over, over a period of time. And he put out excellent rules. He was, you know, a, you know, one of the one. He was one of the one of these wonders, a very special person. Eichelheim would call him a genius, or one of the very special humans in history. But, so that's the Athens example of how money can be used, and you're using it in, in, in the way we do today, but in a way that brings about democracy for people and well-being for everyone. I'm going to jump ahead now and talk a bit about, there's a, a wonderful example that we really need to go back in our own history and learn from. And that's the Pennsylvania colony from the 1720s to, to the revolution. There, you have a government who does just what, what it does in the beginning. They figure this out. And I'll read that again, and then I'll, I'll use that to explain Pennsylvania. The power of the people's credit should be used to ensure that whatever is socially and physically possible is also financially possible. Pennsylvania did that. In 1721, 
a mayor, I'm not sure if it was a mayor at that moment in 1720, he was getting old and he was going to die later that year, I think he might have dropped out, but his name was Jonathan Dickinson, he was also a merchant, he knew what was going on. He says, I don't know how we're going to make it through the winter. People are leaving, people are going hungry. We have uh, the docks, the merchants have goods, metal goods, woolen goods, other goods from uh, England, but they're sitting on the dock. The farmers have produce. They also have lumber that needs to be cut down to get to the shipyards, but we have no medium of exchange. England has not allowed us to make our own coins, to take our bullion and make coins. They stopped that 40 years earlier in Boston when they tried it. And and what, what the colonies did to, to help themselves out, to give themselves a medium of exchange, they would pay a higher rate. They would pay for five and a half ounces of silver from the pirates. They would, they would give a higher price per sterling than they were offering in England. So they were enticing pirate ships where they were allowed to mint and get mint. The pirate ships who had been stealing would come up the coast and uh, unload their their coins, including Arab gold coins, and, and the people locally learned to pass that around, and that became the medium of exchange. And a little after, seven, well, 1697, early 1700s, England began to clamp down on that. So by the early 1720s, you end up having a society that has little to no medium of exchange, and things are pretty desperate. By the way, if you read the Austrian School of Economics on this, they have it wrong, and you, you should. We could. I'll talk about that later if people have questions about that. Um, anyhow, I'll come back to that. But so we have this Jonathan Dickinson who says we're not going to get through the winter, and things just carry on. In, this, in 1723, things are bad enough. They passed a bill, and they were going to issue their first paper notes. And they had watched a few other colonies do that, and they learned from it, and they, they said, we're going to do it. We're going to learn the lessons from them, and we're going to do it really well for fun. And they, and they did some things really interesting. They created paper notes, down a paper note down to a shilling, and a shilling and a half, and real in small denominations, very small denominations. They then let they in the first year they had two. They issued uh, fifteen thousand pounds, and then found out the need was much higher. So they were guessing by their pants how much money they might need in society. They had no idea, but they started out with a small amount. And then based on the demand for people needing more money, they, and how they put it into circulation was you can mortgage one-third the value of your house or one-half the value of your land. And, and so that's how much money you could obtain. If you would default, and there are very few defaults, and I'll explain that, but if there was, they, in the worst case scenario, and I only, I'm researching this now, and I know very few cases like this, but they could mortgage off, I mean, auction off the land or the house. They would receive the money, they'd pay back your half or a third of whatever it was, and then you would keep the rest of it beyond their costs. And there's, there's only a few cases I know of that. Late, so later in 1723, they, the demand for this money was so great that they, they went up to 40 45,000 pounds in that very first year, and it didn't quite all get issued until uh, March of uh, 1724. Some very interesting things were done, though, which is the opposite of what we do today, and we need to highlight that because they're very important for us to learn for what's going on today. When they issued the law, they said, this money we're not going to give it to those who are rich, who want to be able to make their bigger investments and move the goods and take their percents. No. We were going to issue this money for the poor and the industrious people. 
for the poor and industrious people. We don't do that today. We think that money has to go to the riches, so they invest the money so the rest of us can get jobs. In Pennsylvania, they said it doesn't, they figured out, and they said, we don't think it works that way, and we're going to, and so what they established was their loans could be as small as 12 pounds, and in the first bill, they went up to 100 pounds. Later, they, they would go up to 200 pounds, and uh, later on in, 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 in that century, they went up to 300 pounds. But they limited the amount of loans so that the rich couldn't be getting all the money and making use of it. They wanted to give, but they gave out thousands of small loans. They gave out actually 3,000 small loans by 1739. And they wanted commerce to be local and for people to move around in a local way with small denominations, which was new for them too, or they created that idea. <coughs> Okay. Sorry. So microloans. Microloans, right. Now, what happened in the law, it said, when this gets paid back, oh, well, wait, i got to say one more thing. Of that 45000 they loaned in 37 and a half thousand pounds into circulation. They loaned it in. The other seven and a half thousand pounds they spent into circulation. The federal, their Pennsylvania Assembly, their, the whole colony, their state, which might be the counties, and the city of Pencil, uh, Philadelphia. So they did it all three levels. They passed money down to all three levels, and they could spend that money directly into circulation. Much like you would learn in this book, it was social credit on how Tumblewood D built its bridge without having to have tolls. So they've loaned money into circulation and they've spent money into circulation. But they, the conservatives among them said, oh, this is very dangerous. So what they said is, they, got, they had it put into the two original issues that when the money was paid back, it had to be burned out of existence. Yeah. So they started. Everything, all of a sudden, everything's humming. In 1724, people are breathing again. There's commerce. There's uh, the, the outflow of people. The empty homes that are in Philadelphia, they're beginning to be filled again. And there's life, and there's happiness. 1725, things are going pretty good. In 1726, I'll just go over this. I've written this in long detail. I'm trying to put it in a book for young people. And I'll give it to you in a very summary form. But what happens is, well, I'll give it to you in a summary. It's they burnt out of existence 6,200 pounds. And I was able to go over the exact figures, by the way. And this is important because this is another argument against government being able to do anything right. The, the, if you looked at their laws, and I've read the laws, and I've gone over them in charts, and I created the charts, I've gone over in detail. And by, seven, by January, of 1726, they had to burn out 6,200 pounds. Then I went to their actual records of what they had burned out, and it was like 6,240 pounds. They were extremely close of what the law issued. We can issue this much money. We have to burn it out of existence. That's what the law says we're going to do it. And the, and the people, the trustees, and the people who are in charge of their money system did exactly what government wanted, what, the, what, the, what this good working government wanted. And they, did it, and they didn't overdo it, they, they carried out their mission. The, and they did it again, they did that in other ways later on, and I'll, I hope to mention a few more. So, they burned it out of existence, and guess what? When you burn money out of existence, 
they, they started seeing there's a very fundamental problem here. The interest rate on this money was 5%. And 5% say of um, 40 of uh, 40,000 pounds. We'll just take that number for right now for what they loaned into existence. It's a round number. Is 2,000 pounds. So in the first, in the very first year, when you have to pay back money, you have to pay back 40,000 pounds plus 2,000 pounds interest. Well, that interest money was never created. When the money they spent into existence, that was taxed out of existence separately because of liquor and slavery. As you know, Quakers were abolitionists and they wanted to end slavery. And they had scruples at that time and to end slavery. They just put a high tariff on slaves and saying, you know, we don't want to have, we don't want a business of importing slaves, so we're going to put a high tariff on slaves to, to lower the slave trade into Pennsylvania. Um, they also were concerned about imported liquors because they were able to produce their local hops, and so they had they kept liquor. But that two thousand dollars, and because they were not involved in the French Indian Wars, they weren't fighting the Mohawks, or they weren't fighting the Seminoles, and, and they were getting along with their native people. They they were able to remove a lot of their taxes to raise money before they would have a property tax and a poll tax, maybe akin to an income tax. They got rid of all of those because the interest on 40,000 pounds was 2,000 pounds. That was enough money to cover their expenses. It was 800 pounds to the crown, four to 500 pounds to the Native Americans for lands being lost and forestry lands were turning into agricultural lands, uh, crops, and um, and then they had four or five hundred to spend on roads and, and other things they needed locally and regionally. So, but, but the interest was not created. So you, had 40, you have 40,000 pounds that are paid back. You have 2,000 pounds that are interest in after the first year. And, and if you were to call back all loans or call in all loans, you'd have 2,000 pounds of uh, foreclosures. By, se uh, by 1726, two years into this, they realized what was happening. And they said, Jesus, we gotta, you gotta put a stop to this. What they did was said, one, we gotta stop burning the money. We can't afford this anymore. We gotta keep paper money. It's working very well for us. We've gotta keep it in circulation. So they, they, they have it in circulation, and, sorry, I was distracted by the desserts there. <laughs> 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 Might be time to wrap up. Excuse <laughs> me. Um, We're all distracted by the desserts. <laughs> we have, okay. The, the interest can't be paid, and people, and money's being burned, and the population's growing a little bit, and things are going okay, but all of a sudden, they're losing their medium of exchange, and they can see, you know, the house of cards falling in. And so they, they stopped the burning of money, and they said, if notes are coming in and they're getting old, we need to reissue them. And they passed that law, too. And, then, and they also figured out that and they knew, they, they under, sort of understood this from the beginning, too, that when, when the interest came in, the assembly was, was able to spend it. And they said, gee, the, indeed, the assembly cannot sit on the money. It has to spend, on them, spend that money. And we also have to spend money into circulation so people can pay off that interest rate, too. They can locate the interest, not the money. The other thing, too, is they noticed that if people were hoarding money, other people could be paying it back. That has important implications today. People want to save and be thrifty and save money. And so if they're saving money, other people are having a harder time paying it back. 
So they, when people borrow money, and people, when we as a society give people loans, we're putting, we want them, we want to make sure they're able to pay back those loans. We don't want to give them a loan and take away their job. As a society, if we're giving out loans to people, and that's becoming part of our money su supply, we want to be darn sure they have jobs to be able to pay them back. And these people knew that. And they said, we're working with the poor industrious, and we know they're going to be industrious, because we're going to, that there's the work to be done. There's the infrastructure that needs to be done to build colonial Pennsylvania, and we're going to get it done. From being those desperate situation in 1721, by 1741, Benjamin Franklin is able to say, in every household, contentment. Imagine if we could say that today. In every household, contentment. That's yeah, a paraphrase, but it's, it's close. One more thing, and I'm going to drop Pennsylvania and get up to the modern times, is it, it deals with peace. Quakers, as you know, aren't big into wars. So from 1721 to 1745, they stayed out of all wars, and they didn't need to, they, did, they could stop any heavy taxing at all. In 1745, the king really put the screws on him and said, you know, you, you need to give some money to, for the king's use, extra money, and they gave him 5,000 pounds. So they gave him their local money, and the king then could, could spend it into circulation, and, and he would spend it in for hemp, for rigging on ships, and everything else he needed for war production, for salaries too. The Quakers stayed out, and then there was a big breakup in 1756. Quakers walked out of their assembly who were for peace, and the other Quakers said, yes, we've got to go to war. We're, the screws are being turned on us again. We have to go into the French Indian War from 1756 to 1763. And during that period, up, up until 1776, they only had 85,000 pounds that had been in circulation since 45 and 80,000 pounds since 1739. And that regular amount of money in circulation kept this medium of exchange, kept the economy going. Now listen to this. From 1756, over the next eight years to 63, they, they created up to over 500,000 pounds for the war effort. And they, they were just humming. And it, this wasn't, in, it, it produced a little, it did produce some inflation. Inflation wasn't really a problem, but this amount of money went for the war effort, and it was just go, go, go. We, you know, the French, you know, won a, won a battle in Ohio, and we now have to get into this, we have to get into this war. In 1763, they, the war ends, the British want, wins, and now we can, we can settle down again. What happens then is, in, 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 in for the next six years, until 1769, they took 25,000 pounds out of circulation. The population's growing, but they could, in 1726, there was deflation. In seven, in this, during the French Indian War, there was inflation. But after the war, they could make adjustments, government doing this well again, not, any, not the Fed or any private concern, but government itself, looked at adjustments that we can start lowering the money, and they started taxing money out of circulation and, and sitting on it. And then in... Um, and they were gaining, remember, they were issuing the money, they could spend it or loan it. I'm going to go to a, an example that I'm going to jump up because I only have four more minutes right now. Benjamin Franklin in the 1760s is going off on one of his jump, jumps, 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 he's going off to England. He's probably actually talking with Adam Smith. But one of the ideas he's bringing up in England is says, hey, 
We're doing really well with our seniorage money, our right to issue money and put it into circulation, and it's a public fiat money, and it's really working well for us. He didn't use those fancy terms, but he, he well, he, they had the concept seniorage then. The people back in Pennsylvania said, holy mackerel, what's going on? We don't want to lose our seniorage. What is Franklin talking about? He's telling them that they can start their own Bank of England. You know, these were British colonies. So in your British colonies, you can start a Bank of England. You, The Bank of England could be issuing the money in the colonies, and you could be making the interest rate. Instead of Pennsylvania making its 2000 per year, and every other colony, you guys could be cleaning up with your interest rate by having seniorage rights of introducing new money into circulation. The Pennsylvania people who understood this problem yanked him out of England really quick. Get back here, you're being recalled. Don't talk to anybody. <laughs> Keep your mouth shut, oh, Uncle Ben, and get back here. Okay, so that's the importance of seniorage. I'm going to jump up today because we only have a few minutes. But with the NEED Act, it's 2990. Dennis Kucinich, uh, Conyers from Michigan, is now a co-sponsor. Other people are being interested. We need education. Without education, this bill, the next bill, and the next bill, they're all going to fail. But we have to go around. I'm working on educating and writing for young people to get into this. You need to be a part of this. This is an idea and an understanding whose time has to come. We have to be able to issue our own public credit again. The system is clogged up. Right now, this, if you know Michael Milken, the junk bond dealer, he says, at $1,000 ahead, you've all paid 1000 to come today, right? Well, I'm going to tell you what he told his people. He said, go out and collateralize the commons. Find Antarctica. Find local resources in third world countries. And turn that into money. You can make loans on it. We need collateral. It, it, in the 80s, they wanted to start a bank. You might have remembered it was the United Nations Bank. They wanted to make Antarctica, the Ozarks, uh, Serengeti Plains, and other places into a, a conservation bank. And this, again, is the issue. Based on those resources, you can, you can create new money. If that money goes into default, what does what, what the creditor hold? He gets to hold those, those resources again the people that were in trouble. So what HR 2990, oh wait, the short answer on what Michael Milk is, we're in a, such a situation we would really need one to two more Earths, literally, to go around the planet, to go around the sun to collateralize. <laughs> it is. That's what it's going to take. If you look at real economy versus this paper inflationary economy on top of it, or this, this money economy, we don't have the collateral. And when the asset value of your homes goes for 400000 down back down to 200000 that's money that comes out of the economy that disappears because it doesn't exist anymore because we don't give it that value. And there's no, no more collateral, therefore no more loans, and we're not getting loans in spite of the Federal Reserve putting huge amounts of money into the banks. And loaning is supposed to go up under fractional reserve tenfold. Instead, it's going in the opposite direction. It's declined. It, so the whole system is, is fried right now. And I'm giving, I only got 30 seconds a minute now. So what, what a, coming back to the beginning of the story, 2990 stops fractional reserve banking and it introduces what we could call positive money or a new U.S. money that's not debt oriented. It's not debt. It's new money that can come in into the system. And if you stop fractional reserve banking, that multiple expansion, that would be very deflationary. So you would have to spend money and figure out with the commodity of goods, the con proper uh, consumer price index, what's the inflationary amount. And guess what? 
if Pennsylvania could do it 250 years ago, I think we should be able to do it today. Yeah. So I'm going to end shortly. I really enjoyed being here. We've got to get behind 2990, but we also have to educate ourselves. Thank you very much. Let's start with questions. I'm going to work right around. Go ahead. Okay, what is, um, what is fractional reserve banking? Okay, fractional reserve banking. It's when a bank, or you can take all banks together. Say if all banks together have whatever figure, $100 billion, and then all banks together they can then, by fractional reserve bank, they have to hold on to 10%. There's a trick in this. There's something very important, and it's very misleading. And I'm, there's a huge thing, and you got on, I'm going to explain bank accounting. And I have to, even if, believe it or not, I have to explain even this to economists. And I work with bank, ex I study and I interview bank examiners, and I'm going to make a key point here. What happens is the banks do not, say if there's $100 billion, they do not take that $90 billion and pass that out. No, that's what this act would do. They said, okay, there's $90 billion over there. We're going to create a new $90 billion. So that new $90 billion gets lent into circulation. And now you have 100 plus 90, you have $190 billion in total circulation with fractional reserve. And then when that nine, $90 billion goes in, I, I, I have a, a, um, some charts. You, you know what? You could. Uh, how did it create the bank Yeah, what you need to do is look up modern, Google modern money mechanics. And it'll, it, uh, up the first 10, 11 pages of Modern Money Mechanics will explain it. But the big thing is, though, it's they're not lending anybody else's money. They keep it there. They're creating new money over here, and that's the big point. Okay. And it looks like this. Over here is the original money, and then here is this dark area up here. Is each time they can create new money, and it, it goes in, in at 10%, you actually can tenfold the amount of money. Can you, can you electronic money I think what I think what we're trying to do. I think what we're trying to do is just I'm going to try to explain this real quick. Say I have ten dollars is bank access, okay? I only need a dollar of that money, say, for people to do the banking business on, and perhaps I could loan that ten dollars if I loan out ninety dollars. And I only back it with about ten dollars. Everybody is not going to come at once to uh, get my money out of the bank. The whole system is this: I have ten dollars in assets, or maybe a dollar in assets, and I loan out ten dollars on that dollar. There's ninety percent that's not working, and what that simply means is you hope not everybody's going to come to the bank at once to collect my ten dollars in assets that's only backed by a dollar. You're only hoping that the amount of money that's needed to service the loans is a dollar and not ten. Fractional reserve banking simply means that this dollar can produce ten dollars in loans only needing about a dollar in assets. Let me just add on a point to that. And what happens here is there's ten dollars for bank, what's called bank liabilities, but it's ten dollars that the bank has there, and it says we're going to leave it here, and it's only electronic money anyhow. But we're going to leave it here, and we're going to create nine dollars over here, new money, and we're going to put this now and loan this into circulation, and so now in circulation is nineteen dollars. And this goes on until from ten dollars you would end up when you continue that it'll go up to a hundred dollars. Does that make sense now, Ellen, about your question being answered? It, it, 
fractional reserve banking is like mud. It, 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 it takes a little time to get to so it. What's the alternative to the fractional? Okay. I mean, it's, it, it, it's the depositors who have the ten dollars. Mm -hmm. This actually gets loaned out. Oh, the money and that they get in, they, they get, get it. That very same money gets loaned up. So instead of loaning uh, 190 percent, they can only loan what they have on hand. Okay. Uh, me. Yeah, you're one. That you're who is second? Yeah, me. All right. Um, so two questions, and that is, so when they create the 90, um, the nine, the extra nine, that is created as their as in their asset, right? So these are private institutions that are just creating an asset for themselves. That's my first question. And then my second question is, um, the NEED Act, how would that get money into circulation? Okay. They, when, you, when you sign your name on a loan and you have a promise to pay, that, that loan, be, Becomes an asset. Becomes an asset, and the, and the bank can turn that in for cash when it needs it for the Federal Reserve so through the just, discount window. It's just creating assets. Or to other banks. Yeah. Just, create, just yeah. adding to their riches. Right. And, with, and all, all that the Need Act says is if you start with $10, you better figure it out with your depositors because when you loan it out, you're actually going to loan out the depositors' money. So you need to. Depositors need to be able to take risk, and that what that was why I said earlier we need to think about our future. Do we want to, do we want to have two percent inflation or should we have zero percent inflation? We can target either one. And how about the need act? The need right. act created creating money. How does it create? Oh money? yeah, the need act creates money. The, the economy would start collapsing without monetary expansion, right. even though it's not happening right now. Right. And because it's not happening, and because we still have to be paying back, but the money doesn't really exist out there now, based on all, because we're, we're, old, we're way over our heads. We are in what's called the capital asset stripping phase of the economy now. This is what bankers are doing to us. They're taking your asset and stripping it because that's the business they're in. They're collecting the collateral. Right. So how does the NEED so Act? The NEED Act says government needs to be able to print money and spend it into circulation. New money that's positive money. It's not based on debt. For it's just, infrastructure. It's just like I said about Pennsylvania. They, they created 7,500 pounds and they just spent it into circulation. The the federal the uh, the federal would be would belong part of treasury and the treasury would create money and that would be spent into circulation for for infrastructure jobs. All right, and Jeff's next. Uh, yes, it, toward the end of your talk, you made a reference to the effect that we did get 50 years ago. Here's the part um, of the and so why can't we do it now? 250 years ago, Pennsylvania oh, okay. did it. Okay. 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 Um, and I'll go proud. Is it exactly okay. the same? Go ahead. Two ninety. Two ninety. What is the economy of each fall employment? I'll just end up. I couldn't hear what you said. That's kind of out of date, isn't it? From the day when everything was done by a unit of labor, which was put in the four Jacksons. Today, with the innovation and the increase in efficiency. It's possible that you can actually create more goods continually with the same labor force. You're absolutely right. I totally agree with you. And this is all I'm all I'm doing here is I quoted to you what they're teaching high school students. I, if I had more time, yes, it's written right in this book. Every blue sheet here is where I photocopied to put on a PowerPoint. And I've gone to economists, and I said, a reform-minded economist, and said, this is what they're teaching. And like you, they can point out mistakes with it. But the essence of what that's saying is, yes, in, in typical economic thinking, you know, you, he's setting up the argument that too much money chasing too few goods 
and you're saying that's not realistic any longer. And I agree with you, but we're talking basic economics of the teaching high school students and college students. By the way, this is, if you saw Inside Job, Michigan, Frederick Michigan, who was on the Board of Governors, this was the textbook he was creating when he, when he left the Federal Reserve. If anyone wants to see it, I have an advanced copy of it. But he says basically the same thing there, too. You, uh, you, you implied to me that you read the Federal Reserve publication called Modern Money Mechanics. Yes, I In know. that publication, the bank says we can create any amount of money that you could imagine. Uh, all we, because it's just credit. Right. What banks actually lend, they do not loan their deposits. They loan credit based on the deposits. You're exactly right, and that's a key tip. You haven't made that clear. Well, thank you. And I hope that explains it to the woman next to her. So, with they've accepted deposits here, real money here that's been put in, and over here they're creating credit. But the big the important thing though is once you've created credit and you loaned out loaned out credit and people go ahead and spend that credit, guess what? That's now real money. That credit turned into real money. Because when the people who earned it, and they put it in their banks, they want it in as their money. So that's how fractional reserve works. But the Need Act changes that. Okay. Sir, what does this mean? If you read Title 12. All right. So next. All right. Next. 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 What I'm talking about in these uh, countries, in, in ancient Greece, okay. Attica, You're right. and, and like uh, Athens, right. the, the majority of the population was slaves. And there was some degree of free labor, like you said, in agriculture. But the slaves are the ones that dug in the mines and everything right. to produce the armaments and everything. Right. So these countries could go to war and plunder other uh, other uh, uh, city states. Yes, that's so the true. Source, so the With source the of the money is actually the production of the slaves. But yeah. you didn't bring that out at all. Um, yes, and chiefly what you're saying is right. But let's, let's look at it in, in a little a little detail for a second. First of all, slaves really doesn't become a big issue until. Alexander the Great. During the classical period before then, slaves is much more, um, much less, much, much less. It, it goes way out of proportion with Alexander the Great. But you're right though, slaves and others were used in the mines, not always slaves by the way, they were also free people. <coughs> but they were compensated, they would be, they could use, earn uh, what was called one Odal or Odal, but it, you, they could earn their money, and depending on who your master was, you might be able to earn your, yourself your freedom from slavery, and that was fairly common then. Okay. But yes, do we need to have people going in mines today? Do we need to be mining Mother Earth for precious metal with you know for the libertarian idea? I don't think so, and it's and it. it and as you learn from Sparta, we don't need to do that uh, by creating any creating any kind of money system. We have a different form of slavery today. Okay. Called wage slavery. All right. Yeah. Let's. Well, we'll get into that in a couple minutes. Charlie. Yes, sir. Steve, how did we end up with the one percent? <laughs> too much legislation or not enough? <laughs> it, it was both. What happened with the, on the legislation side, you still you went through the last 40 years of slow, bit by bit by bit of deregulation, of where the rich were taxed less from the 1970s, 1970 up until now, and they, and they were able to, as their power grew, they were able to con more and more control K Street and then, and then Washington itself. But remember, the, there was a key thing, though. With the Federal Reserve Act, there was a tragic flaw in that act, which allowed that fractional reserve banking and 
who with that, the bankers could use that over time to gain more and more power, as I said. They could increase their fractional uh, banking. And then with deregulations, as you know from Lehman and, and, and Goldman Sachs, they're up to 300, and 300 to 1 or 43 to 1. So if you invest $1,000, could you afford, if you lost that thousand dollars, could you afford to also pay forty-two thousand dollars? And then, you know, we, we were allowing them to work on margins. So the answer is two parts. One is yes, we've got to change all sorts of regulation, and two, uh, we have to change the structural form of the Federal Reserve Act, and the Need Act does that. Okay. All right. Uh, I'll go back here to Bob. And then we'll go okay. to you, sir. Let's say we get rid of I'll, fractional I'll. reserve banking. Let's yes. say we got rid of fractional reserve banking and a wave of prosperity, you know, swept over the country. And everybody that wanted a job could find one at, at a minimum wage of 100000 a year. <laughs> what do you think would happen to rent? Wow. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> no, wait, 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 wait. There's two things that can happen. You could, as this gentleman pointed out earlier, this fellow is just standing up. He said it's within the comp productive capacity of society to build many homes. So you have, you can still have a market system in the future where you can have many different homes being built. Yeah, but what are homes built on? Uh, hopefully, good foundations. But I guess <laughs> <that's all right. laughs> land. Land. Oh, I'm sorry. I should have recognized. That's what condos are all about. Yeah. You know what? In, in terms of my own personal studies, I, I you know, I, I've just met some people from the Henry George School in England, and I have a bunch of literature. And land and population are, are, are you know, something we really need to be thinking about. And my idea as an educator, I talked about education when I work with young people. Right now, I don't push, this is me, but you may want to change the way, and I'm, I'm, I'm open to being changed, is rather than talk about population control, a la China model, I talk about population education, and, I, and I'm trying to push that. Also, you can, you can do that with land, too. But as you can see, in the same way land was more available in Pennsylvania, land's less available today. And we, and we, we need to think about it as a, as a precious thing. And then the question becomes, how are we going to, not only land, but resources, how are we going to share land and the resources of the earth for everybody? Do we want to use the Sparta model, where everyone gets an equal share of everything? Yeah. Or do you want to use the solid model where you, you make laws that push people towards multi democracy and the need act does that? I'm open. All right. You're next, sir. All right. I have a question, a uh, sort of a follow up to what he's talking about. Yeah. Uh, Title 12, Section 411. You can redeem Federal Reserve notes for lawful money. That way, the banks do not have access to the money that you deposit. You can have a, an account set up so that all deposits and withdrawals are made in lawful money. Okay. So the bank won't have access to the money that they have. When you when you began your statement, I and you you were presented in. in article, I'm, I'll, I'll review that. Okay. You know, I've looked over that and I may need to see it again. But I, I, when you described both the legal tender that you described, I didn't know any difference. Can you, you know, explain that again? Say that again. You can again. only get lawful money from a bank or the Treasury Department. Mainly right. the banks have it. They have give you their money, which is Federal Reserve notes. But if you demand with the law, Title 12, Section 411, yeah. you can get the lawful money, which you pay no taxes on, and they cannot use, you get your money right. Once you deposit your check, if you write that on the check and walk out to the ATM, right. you have available cash. They do not have access for your money for three days. Okay. Well, yeah. I, basically, it's still really simple to me. 
coins okay. going, I would say, I would, I don't know this is where you're going, but I would say coins are a moral money today, right? It's a moral money. The bills and notes that only promise to pay bills and notes, and how banks get bills and notes is by trading in their assets of loans if they need to, and, and then they, they uh, get the cash they need, and then they, they can use it if, if, if people want to go to the teller or the ATM and get cash. Otherwise, they're just going to deal with this electronic money. And the only way you get around that problem is the libertarian solution of gold and silver. But we've, we've discussed that. Are there, I'll make another general rule here. Anytime, anytime you want to make, you want to have a money and you want to invest it, it has commodity value and you want to make an investment in money, it makes for a lousy money. Wow. Wow. Okay. Uh, go ahead. Yes, you saw it. You cited Michael Milliken as a source. Yes. And I'm kind of puzzled why you would cite a crook as a source. <laughs> yeah, because it's what he said. And he was getting, you know, people looked up to him. And, they, and he said, we've got to collateralize the commons. And that was exactly, and I'll take it, the same statement by, you know, somebody who's well thought of usually is Milton Friedman. We can, you know, yeah, okay, but he's accepted as mainstream and not a crook. And he said, when you do that, Michael Milken is right, and that's what wealth creation is. So when you can find more collateral resources to put money on, you're creating, from Mike Milk, uh, Friedman's standpoint, more wealth. For them? Yes. For the people who want the capital, maybe. <laughs> okay, back in the back there. Yes, so. Uh, do you know if anyone from your organization has tried to uh, contact Occupy Chicago or Occupy Wall Street or anything? I would like to tell you they were on the phone to me today constantly trying to get me down there and I told them I can't go tonight because I'm over here at the Lincoln restaurant. But we're, so get we're, down there quickly. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm working on my way around the room. And is there anybody who hasn't had an initial first question? I'll go with you, and then I'll go with you, and then you. Yeah, uh, a lot of people don't seem to know much about economics, uh, particularly when they vote and you hear why they vote and so on and so forth. Do you think it would be useful to have uh, compulsory economic education in our schools, perhaps starting as early as kindergarten? Yes, yeah, you know, that you just, you know, you're going right into hitting them letting me hit a home run on this, this is right into my area of thinking, because I've spent the last 30 years in education in various ways as a resource person. And I, I uh, for the state of Alaska, I, I, I wrote their heritage curriculum for third and seventh grades, and, and I wrote other things for high school, so I'm very concerned. Right now, I've collected about every economics textbook or, or track on money for kids, and basically, you get money uh, you find the books for uh, how to how to save money. Um, then, as you get older, you know maybe how you start your 4-H, how to start a little business, and then you get a little older, how do we borrow money? And they teach you how to borrow money, but they do not teach you how money works in society. And you're right; it needs to be a part of. Uh, public education, and you it should have a scope and sequence going through the years. How does the government know initially how? How does the government know initially um, the amount of money that they should circulate? I mean, is there a formula like a dollar per American? And, do we know how much money has been issued so far? I mean, what, what's out there? You know what? You can do it by the seat of your pants. And that's it. Remember, that's exactly how Pennsylvania did it. In March 1723, they put in 15000 There was much more demand for the money, and they, they were able to put in another 30,000 30, uh, 30, um, pounds. But 
what happens is you you over issue. Remember they issued that eighty five thousand. They went up to over five hundred thousand pounds in a very short period. The system didn't dissolve. No, everyone stayed extremely busy for a while. Yes, there was inflation during that war. They were to bring it down afterwards, but. They could bring it down. You can have inflation and deflation, but you have a government that's responding in a good way, and your government can do it. They did it in 1726, and, and then in the 1760s, wonderfully well. Uh, you have a question there? Yes. Uh, yeah, Dennis Kucinich is uh, certainly, uh, you know, I'm no expert on this, but he's certainly one of the most liberal uh, people in the House of Representatives. What I want to know, a lot of bills are put in by somebody, and they go nowhere. Now, are there uh, co-sponsors, uh, an extensive list of co-sponsors for this bill, and are any of those uh, Republicans, and is there a companion bill in the Senate? You know, we need to give you a leadership position. Would you come down to Occupy Chicago with me? We really need you. <laughs> I'll be there Monday at a big demonstration. Okay, Yay! great. All right. All right. Jeff, you had another follow-up to follow-up. Follow-up on the original question where we got confused as far as 50 years versus 250 years. All right. If I recall your trip, it was that you talk about Athens versus Sparta. Yeah, the, the Spartan money was not accepted outside of Sparta, right. whereas the Athenian was. Right. All right. Now, if I would be correct in guessing that Pennsylvania did not have anywhere near the size of a trade deficit that we have, can you imagine how I would be concerned that insofar as extra money would be printed up here, that we need to import some Saudi oil in order to survive? And that it had better be possible for the Saudis to be able to convert the money that we print and send to them for probably, in their case, gold. Is it in a, otherwise? And, and, and what they're going to do is they're going to continue to raise the price of the oil commensurately. See, me, because we don't produce any more. If you understand my drift. Yeah. If you get the mic, try not to get too close. If you get too close, it'll, it'll die on you all of a sudden. Okay. But anyhow, just to. Um, I need to think on your question again. Just say it again. All right. With respect to the Saudis, that if you print more money as you want to do, it figures that the Saudis are going to raise their oil price commensurately because we're not producing any more stuff. Sorry. Oh, you're absolutely right. We buy the same number of ounces of gold. You're absolutely. Yeah. You're absolutely right. You have the Saudis producing oil. And, and ransoming and blackmailing it or doing whatever with it, and they're demanding. You know, it makes me think of Brenton Woods, uh, Charles de Gaulle made sure that he, he had the dollar became the world currency at that point, basically. But he wanted and, to go and, to Fort Knox. Right, right. And he said, we got to make gold convertible. Yeah, we kept it convertible. And, and now it's not. And, uh, and if we have a real money system, what happens? Well, we may want to say, you know, Saudis, you're getting our dollars. Um, please spend them back in our economy. Okay. What if they want gold? Right. And not what we make, which is next to nothing. Then we better, we, then the market forces take place, and we've got to come up with alternatives. But it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that we don't have to change our monetary system. It, there's work to be done in the future. We're going to be cutting off questions in about three minutes, so keep it brief. Okay, um, so I don't need the mic. So um, the feds gave $16 trillion to the banks, we found this out from the Federal Reserve Audit, that they're just sitting on, the big banks, okay? Right. And we're actually paying them interest because they're loaning it back to us like assholes. We're paying them interest on this. So I hope in the NEED Act that that money gets 
taken back from them. Because what's happening right now is that we have a shrunken uh, monetary supply down here on the streets. And if you say to the banks that you can no longer create any money, we will have bank closures all over this country because the money supply will completely shrink unless we're talking about in the NEED Act a huge expenditure, a huge uh, infrastructure program to pay into... Okay, what's your question? Yeah. And that was my question. If you don't understand it, no, sorry. No. You can, <laughs> sorry. I, I gave this in the presentation, but basically here's what I was pointing out to. Here's the reserves. This is the $16 trillion, basically. This is UK, but the same thing happened there. You can see it in this graph. Here, here comes huge amounts of money from the Bank of England into the system. When that money goes into the system, or the Federal Reserve, it's taking in assets. If Ben Bernanke flew across the United States right now, he could, he wouldn't, he could look from one window to another and look at his property because they have all sorts of property. Because, the, but your point's a good one. Here's the banking system's reserves, and when when they're pumping all of this cash into the system, you would expect loans, and this is loans, to go way up based on fractional reserve banking, but indeed it's gone in the other direction because of the lack of collateral. The lack of collateral is the limiting factor, not how much money is being pumped into the system. So the Fed is doing a strong disservice. There has to be adjustments, and those adjustments can be, can be made, and the NEED Act does it in a beautiful sort of way, which was devised by Henry Simons in the 1930s and Irving Fisher, these great economists from the time. And we're just, we're, we're, we're riding on their shoulders now. Two more questions. We got you back there and then Charlie. Um, you know what? It's handout answering my question. I was going to ask for us. All right. okay. I was going to ask you for uh, just a quick no, okay. review of the high points of the this House bill. All right. Versus, it's basically the House bill versus fractional banking, right? Yes, yeah, that would be very simplified thinking on it. Yes. Okay. Last question, Charlie, then we Yeah, so we passed this law, one percent says okay, and then there's an equitable distribution of wealth in the United States. <laughs> no. How are we ever gonna legislate an equitable distribution of wealth? We're we're gonna pass a law Wait. and it's gonna happen? Yeah. Basically, Charlie. What planet is that ever on? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let, Let, let's think about that, though. But no, it's like Fabian socialism. You sound like a little bit. <laughs> we can go forward. I gave the Spartan example of Lycurgus, who divided everything up and was very socialistically and fair-minded. Yeah, so long, the long ago. Okay. The other, the other possibility came from Solon, where he took, he didn't have the, the same wealth of land. He had de desperate situation. He had a lot of people, a lot of people coming to Athens from everywhere. And he had to get people to create an economy. And so he, he got everybody to work with their hands to do crafts. And he then put in about six, seven laws that over 100 years, created a, only small landowners, so basically. So wait a hundred years? All right. <laughs> you might, in time, remember though, you remember every ledger, on one side you have debtors, and on the other side you have creditors. Which one are you going to screw? You know, basically, <laughs> you've got to figure it out. And the creditors may be the people holding pensions. So you've got to look at the system structurally and figure out how to change it. You can sweep away everything, and maybe and the Georgers might help us to come up with a new distribution system. Or you may start where we are and try to work incrementally forward. I'm open for both. Okay. Now, instead of how many more people are going to be rebutting tonight, because I'm going to do about four minutes apiece, Get up here, let's start. I'll maintain a four minute clock.
And uh, at promptly at 10 minutes till, our illustrious speaker here is going to have the last word. Let's so thank, uh, let's yeah. thank him and have a wonderful time. Really uh, let's wish uh, Obama. I hope he was. I hope he's feeling okay, and he's, we'll wish him a speedy recovery. No, he's all right. He's oh, that's good. Just a so little. So let's get to the speakers way. and uh, start uh, moving. Four minutes. Well, I certainly agree with the speaker that the cure for this thing is the direct issue of, of treasury money. Uh, one Thank of you. the reasons that that must be uh, resorted to is because of the nature of credit money. As I pointed out, as I questioned before, that he agreed. The banks don't lend money, they lend credit. And if everybody in the whole chain was willing to continue to deal their checks, there never would be a need for a Federal Reserve note. Now, Title 12, the Federal Reserve Act, says expressly that Federal Reserve notes shall be created for one purpose only, and that is bank liquidity. If the banks get caught between the, hard, the two hard surfaces, they go to the window and they discount their paper. Now, uh, there is absolutely no connection between the amount of green stamps, as I call them, on the street and the amount of credit that the banks have extended. What's happening today, the source of the deflation, is unlike in past years, especially 250 years ago, households then were not heavily indebted, if at all. Consumers didn't have credit, basically, except maybe from the butcher shop on a personal basis. So what's happening today when they pay out money, it, the people are not going out and buying shoes or Mercedes or Fords. They are paying down their debts. And when the money, the credit money, comes back to the banks, it disappears from circulation entirely. And that is why the cure must be the direct issue of Treasury money, which doesn't disappear. And uh, I think that's the, the basic point I wanted to make. I'll speak about St. Orange briefly. Essentially, in modern times, say since the time of uh, Henry VIII, uh, coin, our coins, gold and silver coins, have been 10% copper and 90% gold or silver. Uh, Queen Elizabeth I uh, was tipped off by her father, who had debased the currency. He had uh, substituted about 30% copper. And one of her proudest achievements, she wrote, was that with the time she was ready to die, <laughs> she ruled 45 years, you know, from 1558 to 1603. She had restored the integrity of British coinage. And not oh, only 10% copper. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I want to thank the speaker for giving us a good history of money. I have a, when you talk about money, you have to talk about banks, especially in our economy. Uh, now, uh, when I was in school, fractional banking was simple. Fractional banking was if somebody come in with $10, that become the reserve for the bank, and that bank could lend, say, $90 or $100, 10 to 1, because they don't expect that person to come back, or 10 people to come back and get the $10. Now, so therefore, if it had worked back then, I don't see no sin in fractional uh, banking. What I see a sin is, is what we got now. And the third is, the commercial bank was a commercial bank. It is money, you money to buy your car, get your mortgage, and so forth, and so on. And the reason they set it up like that, because they didn't want the bank gambling, taking chances, and doing whatever they wanted to do with phony bookkeeping, procedure, and was nothing wrong with it. But guess what? When they were distracting us about should two men marry, should we have a constitution amendment to define what marriage is, they was passing laws that 
allow commercial banks to merge with Wall Street Bank. Wall Street Bank is a gambling house. <laughs> when they merged with Wall Street, they became a gambling house. The $10 ain't necessary no more. Hell, they could go out and get the house and tell the homeowner, say, hey, I give you 150000 for this. I'll refinance that 150000 So guess what? The homeowner said, yeah, my bar's going to be cheaper. I got 50000 to do what I want with. Guess what? Wall Street, this commercial in the Wall Street cabal, now got $150 they done made up. And if you do that for 500 million times, you come up with three. Then they got another way they can do this. And that is, they can go to the regulators, they can go to Congress and say, I need a, a, a counting rule change where I can put on my books like this. Because accounting is kind of like law. You can't uh, deviate from it unless you get a bribe senator, a bribe representative to change that, or the regulators to change. So that's what they did. Now they come with all kind of tricky accounting procedures that create something out of nothing. Right. And they use that something as a basis to go to the printing, uh, uh, the printing press and say, we need these many trillions. And we running it off 27 hours, I mean, seven days a week, 24, 24 days, uh, 24, whatever it is, studying it. Real money. And guess what? These banking people in that good bell in Wall Street is taking all this money, real money. This ain't no on paper. They got warehouses all over the world full of $100 bills. And now they can expand the money supply as far as they want to. <laughs> And guess what back is? Nothing other than some phony figures that they put in their computer. Yeah. Okay. Next one. Um, basically, I see uh, money as just a reflection of wealth, really. <laughs> and what is wealth? What is capital? Well, if somebody, for instance, picks up uh, part of a tree and carves out an axe, the handle of an axe, he's putting value into that, into that uh, piece of wood. He's putting use value into that piece of wood. And you could match that with the uh, steel and sell it in the market. Now what happens is uh, labor produces all wealth. Yes. And what is and what is capital? What is it? Wealth is used to all wealth. That, yeah. Capital is nothing but accumulated labor. That's all it really is. That's all it's ever been. That's the secret of of what uh, of what our economists don't tell you. That's where they get all the money from. If uh, somebody works, how is he going to make billions and billions of dollars working? He can't. If somebody has something, uh, somebody uh, working for him, let's say 100,000 people or even 1,000 people, he's taking that surplus that that the worker does and using that to accumulate wealth. So if somebody works, for instance, in this day, we could produce our own wages in maybe two hours. And the rest of the uh, capital that is produced goes to the capitalist. That's how he makes his wealth. Surplus value. <coughs> in other words, profit. That's what, that's what, uh, so, uh, that's what uh, surplus value is, is profit. And that's how they make their profits. It's a dirty secret. And the only way to resolve this problem really is we have the socialization of production. For instance, uh, right now, production goes all over the world or is made in a factory or somewhere else. And it takes a lot of people to put these things together. But yet we have individual appropriation. The capitalist appropriates the wealth of the worker. That's how he makes his money. So what we have to do is have economic democracy. 
In other words, the people that produce the wealth should control the wealth. And they should run the economy. Yay! That's the way it should be. And uh, that's the only way you're going to get out of this problem. If you let it go like it is, what's going to happen is you're going to, not going to have a planet to live on. Because these people, the only thing that matters to them is profit. Yeah. And, and, uh, and workers are not, nothing more than the, than the commodity in this society. That's all they are, to be bought and sold in the market. And to make a lot of profit, they're disposable, just like your razor is disposable. <laughs> and, they, and they go into another country if they want cheaper labor. That's what we have to get to. Not the symptoms, but the cause. Yeah, okay. <laughs> right on the money, man. If you want to find out about economics, I would suggest that taking the Henry George courses. That's the best way to really learn. I don't have much faith union. in uh, modern economists. I think they're full of hooey. Uh, I, I took a course about 15 years ago just to uh, remember what I had in college. And they said, oh, 6% unemployment, that's as low as it can go. Well, it's funny, it got down to about zero in World War II when we really needed people. So I have very little faith in uh, modern economists. You want to read another uh, thing that's kind of interesting is a, a cent of The Ascent of Money by Niall Ferguson. Uh, he's pretty conservative, but it's worth uh, reading, and then they have a nice DVD, too. I'd like to thank the speaker because he gave us a good, uh, interesting information and a nice sheet here uh, where we can find the law. I knew how to do this. I was going to say it here, but... Why do I need to say it? It's right on here. What I intend to do is take a look at this bill uh, at, at the where it says thomaslo.loc.gov. You can get the bill and take a look at it. If it looks good, I'm going to take it to UU Social Concerns, Economic Justice and Homelessness Task Force and see if we should uh, support this. This is the way I'm going to respond to the... Uh, speaker by doing something to see if if this uh, bill has legs, is there a chance of getting through? Of course, things are changing so fast, and, and right now, positively, I think there might be a chance that uh, us people on the streets might be able to make this uh, bill uh, go through. Thanks. Bye. I'm going to get a little philosophical here. I think this um, Chief Brown Eagle of the Lakota recently said, you know, the tea beggars talk about freedom, you know, the Americans talk about freedom. When, when, back when the Native Americans were the, you know, um, caretakers of this land, they, they didn't have any private property. The water was owned by Mother Earth and was loaned to the people. And the private and the uh, land was owned by God and only care, you know, caretaken, caretakers by the people. So he said, Americans don't even understand what freedom is, uh, what real freedom is. Back then, the water was free, the air was free, the game was free. We could move freely wherever we wanted to, from land to land. There was no private property, there were no fences. So freedom is a relative thing, and obviously the economy is just a construct, people. Money is just a construct. And I think at this juncture in time, we should really start thinking about really, you know, throw off the, the old uh, ideas about these things and really start thinking about how we're going to develop an economy that really works for everyone in society. It, you know, looking at the Spartans, looking at the Native Americans. There are, there are a number of constructs here that we could look at, so I want to encourage everybody to do that. And the number two thing is, um, the Need Act, right now, uh, the federal government is completely bought and paid for it. They are wholly owned subsidiaries of the big banks. Even Durbin was on the floor of the Senate saying, this Senate is bought and paid for by the big banks. So I do not anticipate that the Need Act will go anywhere. 
No, we need jobs, and we need them now. And we don't need to sell all of our public assets to get these jobs. That's what they want to do, right? They want to sell their, our streets. They want to sell our water. And they say, ah, you know, you want, you want a jobs? Sell us your streets. You want jobs? Sell us your water. So I really, really want to encourage you to think about the concept of an Illinois State Bank, where we, the people, own our own bank, use our own money. It's kind of the Sparta thing use our own money to loan out to our communities to create our jobs as a more kind of immediate solution. I totally believe that some of the things in the NEED Act are necessary, but I totally believe that we are not going to get this thing done until after 2012, and we'll see what happens then. So, thank you. Okay, well, I'd like to thank our speaker for an uh, interesting and stimulating talk. Uh, of course, the, the reason why, you know, this NEED Act or any of these other schemes uh, really won't work uh, is, be is because of the fact that, as, as Adam Smith said and Henry George came along and proved afterwards, uh, all benefits of the society accrue to the landowner. Henry George had a great uh, uh, little story he used to call uh, the last robber. And it was about a guy walking home from work, and all the way home from work, muggers would stop and rob him of five bucks, ten bucks, fifteen bucks, until he got home, and the last robber was the landlord sitting on the on his stairs, and the landlord said, Give me everything you got left. So as long as, as long as we don't if, if we don't reform, if we don't have land reform, if we don't have land tax reform, if we don't stop taxing the landowners, all these benefits will do, uh, getting rid of fractional reserve banking, I said, having this great wave of prosperity, they'll just make rent go up. That's why a house they actually pay you now to go move to Detroit. You know, so a house in Detroit is zero, folks. Land and a house. Zero. They'll actually even pay for you to go there. And uh, uh, an apartment, uh, you know, near the loop, like in Dearborn Park or something like that, or a condo, uh, or a house down on South State Street, $720,000 or $450,000. Well, why is that? Well, it's because the salaries are high here. So there's, a, there's another great story. You know, you, everybody knows the story of Robinson Crusoe and Friday, right? Robinson Crusoe landed first and then he found Friday. I wonder if it was the other way around. I wonder if Robinson Crusoe came to the island and Friday was there. And Robinson Crusoe says, can I live on your island? And Friday would scratch his head. You know, he owns the island because he's, he's, it's his, his island, right? He's been there first. He says, well, yeah, I, uh, you can stay here, but every day, he goes, I, it takes me eight hours to catch one rabbit by hand. And that's what I eat to sustain me. And then the next day I go out and I catch another rabbit by the end, and you know, it takes me eight hours, and it sustains me. He goes, you can stay here on the island, but I'm going to charge you rent. And that rent is going to be one rabbit a day. So now, Robinson Crusoe's got no other choice. He doesn't. He says, okay, but now I'm going to have to work 16 hours a day. I've got to take, take me eight hours to get a rabbit. Then I've got to work eight more hours to get a rabbit to pay my rent. So this is going on and on. Every night he comes back to the campfire, just totally, you know, exhausted and tosses his rabbit to, to Friday. And Friday's had enjoyed the good life. He's sitting out in the sun all day swimming and, you know, playing around. And he's got someone else do his work for him. He eats his rabbit. You know, he eats his rabbit. One day, Robinson Crusoe gets an idea. If I, if I make a spear, I can get more rabbits faster. So he finds a stick and some, a sharp stone and some, some vines, and he makes a spear. And that's capital, by the way. The next day, he gets 22 rabbits. 22 rabbits. And he comes back that night to the campfire, and he's got 22 rabbits hanging on his, on his vine, and he flips a rabbit over to, to uh, Friday, and he says, he's telling about his spear. And they got, this is great, I got so many rabbits. This is so helpful, this capital of the spear. It's increased my you know, productivity so much and everything. And Friday says, well, you know, that's all, that's all good and great and everything, but I got bad news for you. Your rent's going up tomorrow. The 21 rabbits. You see, so essentially, that's essentially the law of rent. And if you read Ricardo, it's the same, you know, this is essentially the same thing. And this is why it doesn't matter all these good things you do. 
Okay. If you don't get down to the crux of the problem, which is planet Earth belongs to all of us. Yep. It's our birthright. And the way that we can all share in the bounty of the Earth is only through a land value tax. Finish. And that is a, a tax on the lo a location value of that piece of land. Okay, if you don't fix that, nothing else is going to work. Okay, and uh, a few definitions. Capital is wealth, but it's wealth that's used to create more wealth. And all, all wages come from profits, that's another thing. And a final definition. Oh, oh. 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 well, that's true. All wages, you think about it. All wages come from profits. And uh, demand is equal to cash plus credit. Oh, oh. is called not letting the next speaker have his time. Yeah. All right. We're all done Let's here. Think, uh, time left. Get yes, you okay. can come up if you need to. All right. All right. All right. Yeah, well, Bob made him, you know, just briefly, Bob made him appropriate. <laughs> Quite was driving at the corporate. But the idea that that all that only that capital comes entirely from labor is laughable. It also comes from innovative ideas. The black folk 150 years ago just kept picking cotton. The only thing that the overseer could think of was to get the black folk to pick cotton. And if they, and if everybody in the country, if there had been no civil war, and they still had the whole South. With a bunch of black folk picking cotton, the South would be dirt poor compared to what it is now. But eventually, those overseers got cleaned out, and other folks were able to come in and bring in new ideas. And that's why now, when you, instead of you've got black folk picking cotton, you've got some black folk working in Detroit and so on making cars. Because somebody like Henry Ford, among others, came up with a new idea. That's where capital comes from. All right. Number one, but to, to return to the larger to the subject here, um, as far as as far as it goes, Steve, I would be of a mind to support what you guys are trying to do. Almost anything would be better than what we've got now. Okay, for starters, what I encourage you to try to think about is what I was trying to drive at in my question about the Saudis and oil and gold. The Saudis, as I understand it, are cornering the world gold market. And contrary to the predictions of various folks, when gold got up to 350, central banks didn't become sellers. They've been buying. The Chinese have realized, oh gee, here in the 90s, we bought a bunch of treasuries. And those things are doomed to an eventual value of zero. What the hell are we going to do? Well, whenever we get the opportunity to, whenever gold sells off, we buy. And the Ruskies and the Indians, the whole lot of them, when you look at a portfolio, what would I rather have? Foreign debt instruments, especially U.S. Treasuries, or gold. Duh! What would you rather have in your portfolio? Well, I'll tell you what, I ain't got no U.S. Treasuries. And I've got a whole bunch of gold. All right. And... You know, I'm doing very well, and I'm going to continue to do very well until something changes. Now, what that something is, I'm not sure. But I'll give you a few names for you to read up on if you have a, an open mind about this stuff. First, there's a guy named Eric Jansen, and his site is itulip.com. A month ago-ish, he wrote a, you know, a major post attempting to explain why gold, which was going down the drain in the 80s and 90s, has been going nothing but north, two steps forward, one step back, three steps forward, two steps back, in the last 10 years. And it's, you know, well, you're worth your read. Another guy who I recommend you read is a, is a guy with an acronym FOFA, F-O-F-O-A, standing for friend of friend of another, another having been a European central banker with the pseudonym of another. Jeff, your time is up. Is it? Yes, it is. Oh. Okay. They, ha they happen to be buying land also, and agricultural. The Saudis and the Chinese. Okay, sorry. Yeah. My Saudis are buying gold. I'm Jules. Uh, a couple comments. Uh, Laura mentioned that our economic system is an abstract idea, and to a certain extent it is. Uh, Stephen uh, has 
defined money as an abstract uh, social power defined by law uh, for use as an unconditional means of payment. And we need to be able to, dis uh, we need to decide where we need to, to take the economy, uh, assuming we get our, uh, uh, take back control of our political system. Uh, Stephen, Stephen Walsh uh, also mentioned what uh, Michael Milken had said, uh, we must now collateralize the commons. And I see uh, there's a movement out here in America that's, well, multiple movements out here to do exactly that. Uh, the, there's a lot of um, state assets like uh, state parks, state buildings, uh, and o other state, state things that, that could be privatized uh, pretty soon uh, if, if banks, or, I mean, if states are uh, going to go into default soon, which Illinois uh, would have if they didn't do that Fiscal Stabilization Act earlier this year and kept flooding the debts pile. But another way that could happen is if states started uh, in, uh, establishing state banks, putting all their, uh, backing it with all their state resources and then loaning out on that and replicating the fractional reserve system uh, within every state. It would create a vested interest within each state for the fractional reserve system, make it a lot harder to get something like HR 2990 uh, through the Congress. And if those states go into uh, that the people they loan out the money to, uh, to uh, uh, go out of business, then the states will have to put their collateral, the, the state lands and the state buildings, up, and uh, that, that would be the collateralizing of the commons. So I would advise against going for uh, state banks and focus mainly on nationalizing our money system, ending fractional reserve banking, through HR 2990, and while we're at it, a land value tax, too. Thanks. It's a race to the We're already collateralizing our assets. Hi, everyone. I uh, am a person that goes down to Occupy Chicago at night. And when I go down there, um, there are different plays that are going on. Uh, one of them is that the police uh, will cause the, um, the group where it's set up to move. They have these large wagons that they use to put everything on. Uh, earlier this week, they had a box. It was a white box and it had a lock on it. And I would go down and put money in it, just like a lot of other people. One night, the police came and said that box had to go. So what happened was somebody took the box and it didn't make it to where it was supposed to go. <laughs> All right. There's no telling how much money was in there. Oh, my God. And then other people came to put money in the box, but the box was no longer there. Another incident is that they play drums. They play these barrels. Okay. I'm a master drummer. I'm one of the best drummers that's on the south side of Chicago. I play a cowbell. Most percussion, when I play, everybody applauds or whatever. They came one night, it was really 3 o'clock in the morning, and took all the barrels. Okay. So these are things that dishearten the people that are there. So I go down and I talk about the spirit. I talk about the fact that you have to have your mind set up such, in such a way that it agrees with your spirit. And a lot that you have to deal with is on the inside of your body, not on the outside, not dealing with these banks and everything, but to understand that you are accelerating your life by coming down here and experiencing all these uh, challenges that go on. About my time is up. No, you've got, you've got another two minutes yet. Okay. So what happens is the next day the guy came up to me because we had talked about these different issues where people come up and say, I want some of this food, but 
you know, he's, he's, whatever his life is, he might be homeless or whatever. People come up and unload cases of food. They come in and they have uh, catering service 